information and I knew that there was something unique about this guy. The following week, um, I'm at work and I learned that he's gone. He just disappeared and uh, he wasn't at the shift, at the scheduled shift that he was supposed to be, you know, testing these components. And I went to my manager and then I went to his manager and from the both of them I found out he just left unexpectedly, didn't give any notice or anything. About a year after that, <clears throat> I get a phone call and I recognize him. And uh, I recognized his voice because uh, he had an English accent. And, and, I, and I immediately started to ask him, oh, what happened? Why did you leave the company? And, you know, this and that. And uh, he dropped his English accent right in the middle of our conversation, which shocked me. Yeah. And um, then he goes on to tell me that uh, he was actually uh, on the run. Um, he had abandoned a, this uh, this. Uh, defense uh, contract that he had been a part of, uh, and he gave me quite a few details. Uh, matter of fact, he told me everything. Okay, hold, uh, let me, let me pause so there. Good. Let me yeah. pause there, Anthony, because this must have been, this must have been very strange to you, and you, you are a researcher, so you have to have your guard up, especially in ufology, but my question is, number one, why did he decide to submit to both your interview, right, but also... Not just the interview, your scrutiny as a researcher, which included, it, according to your book here, polygraph testing and outside confirmation of, cre of credentials. Why that's, did, did he do that? The, yeah, that's the colonel. This the, the person that I'm telling you about is the person that got me in touch with the colonel. Okay, so this was a go-between. He did. That's exactly. He was an intermediary. He's like, like a liaison, and it turns out he's part of this group that, you know, this, this intelligence group that the colonel – you know, part of permanently because of his involvement and because of his. But enemy. why did he feel as though they wanted to utilize you as a, a conduit? Well, it turns out that you got to remember at this point in time, I wasn't writing anything about Delphi. Matter of fact, um, most people that know me, um, they know that the majority of my work over the last decade has been on human origins. And, um, you know, with respect to alien hybrid, uh, you know, uh, alien human hy hybridization. Okay. That's the reason why he contacted me. Ah. He wanted to get in contact with me because my blog, I had a public blog at the time, and some of the things that I had written about had touched the nerve with the, the colonel. I had made some really, really close observations, if not, you know, some of my research was, was touching exactly on what he claims is actually happening. So he felt you were getting close, and he yes. decided you were the perfect person to utilize to get certain information out, which we're going to That's get into. Right. And the two much. of them knew that I had been planning to write a book, so I was the perfect conduit for them to get this information out. Okay, fair enough. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to break here, okay? Mm -hmm. And what we're, do we're going to come back, and we're going to jump right into how this go-between gentleman who lost the English accent gets you in touch with the colonel. Yes. You sit down with this man, and he gives you every answer you've been looking for for a number of years, I would imagine. Don't go anywhere, Anthony. No. Uh, we'll get. We'll be right back. If we take a break, this is Youfinot Radio on KPM 860 with Anthony Sanchez, the Dulce interview. Nine to ten every Saturday night. Stranded here on planet Earth. Youfinot Radio with Jesse Randolph on KPM 860. Back now with Anthony Sanchez, author of the Dulce interview. Probably one of the more exciting books you're going to read on ufology this year. Anthony, welcome back to the program. Now, because of time, we have to jump forward, okay? We have to jump forward in time. I wish we had four hours. We don't. We have one. So I need to go to where you first sat down with the colonel. The go-between has introduced you. Where did you meet? And how many times before you had this possibly historical interview? Well, this occurred in January of this year. Um, we actually spoke by phone first before meeting in person. And um, <clears throat> I had to do a little bit of research on Dulce. I had already, I had already known about Dulce. I mean, yeah, everybody does. Ufology. I mean, yeah, Everybody in ufology knew about Dulce. Sure. But because of the nature of the information that I was receiving from this retired United States Air Force colonel, 
um, one, I had to validate who he was. Two, I had to verify what he was telling me. If you if you read my book, you'll see that I have footnotes everywhere. Every you aspect do. of his story as a researcher, I had to scrutinize. It's very well written. I've seen a lot of ufology books with a lot of typos and a lot of uh, mediocre, shoddy uh, editing. This was not the case with your book. Yeah, I really did, uh, you know, I really, I really tried my best to verify everything that was that was. So you sit down with you sit down with him where the first time? Okay, so we actually meet at a cabin, and I can't disclose the location of the cabin, but I can say that it's in the Sierra foothills. Okay. Um, up here in Northern California, I'll say in, within vicinity of Grass Valley and uh, Auburn. That's Fair it. That's all I can say on that. Fair enough. Um, we meet. Uh, now there was a lot of planning involved with this meeting. Yeah, it seemed as though he had an agenda, and he seems as though the colonel had an agenda for you, as opposed to you trying to talk him into something. Correct? You know, that I'm so glad you say that because you're the first person to actually realize that. Um, because most people think that I, you know, when all of this you know, happened that this was all of my doing. Correct. No, I actually was the one who was the resource being utilized by the colonel. Yeah. And that, you're the first you're the first person to make that observation. Well, I read your book. And if you yeah. read the book, that's what I got as an overall theme is that you were utilized as a vessel, very similar to the way that I am utilized as a radio host here. I'm not a researcher, I'm a vessel and I get the truth out to the new guard and such. But it seems as though the colonel had an agenda for you. So go on. Yeah. So, you know, there's this real enigmatic nature surrounding the whole, you know, story with the colonel that he was conveying to me. So I'm like, okay, look, if I'm going to do this, you know, if I'm, you know, if, if what you're telling me, you know, is, is factually verifiable, then I'll, I'll take it on. Um, so I needed some facts up front. First of all, like I said, I had to verify who he was. Yeah, you're taking the risk. That's right. So in in in, the, in our phone conversations that we had, we had uh, made arrangements uh, to uh, to meet, and uh, so we met twice. Okay. We met twice, and the first time we met, uh, we had actually filed a standard form 180 together. Okay. So this is how we obtained the DD 214, which he told me there would be a clue on there, and. Uh, that will be your proof. It will be the absolute proof that you need. Uh, and was it? It was. It was. And, and if you look. There's a copy of it, correct, in the book? Absolutely. Um, it, it's in the book. Uh, it's. Uh, I just couldn't believe my eyes when I saw this. I mean, so this what? guy seems to, to, to be legitimate to you, which, like I said, is a ufology dream come true. And this is stuff that people beg for. Now, you know in the back of your mind that there are going to be plenty of people who are going to try to burn you at the stake for releasing this information because ufology tends to fight amongst themselves most of the time, and that, that actually keeps us from moving forward a lot of the time. So you knew that going in. Uh, absolutely. Okay. As a researcher, I knew that you know a, a major part of ufology is very incestuous in the sense that People hold on to the information and they keep it within their little circles and they don't, yeah. you know, they don't like to share. They don't like to work. Their... They don't play well with others. Let's just say no. that. I think no. most and will I, agree. And I'm a newbie. I'm a newbie to this whole field with respect to, you know, getting my name out there. Um, one of the things that I had to do was I did two things. One, I conducted an interview with George Ar uh, Jorg Arnu of, uh, of Las Vegas, Nevada, who actually uh, was a resident for a while of uh rachel nevada which is where uh, you know where they have the little alien and, sure uh, yeah i've been and, there uh, that's right so um i had a i have a two-hour recorded interview that i conducted with the uh, york where i got as much information as i could on norio hayakawa <laughs> yeah he's been on the show but no. when i had norio on he didn't have the goods okay he's a very nice guy but this uh, is a guy that you sat down with that is from what I can see, the only person that has come forward that has actually worked at this facility. So let's get into the meat and potatoes a little bit. What were some of the things that he had on his agenda that he wanted to get across to you? Why was he so interested in sitting down with you? Why now? 
one, because of my, you know, the, the connection that was established with the fact that I had done a lot of research on the genetic aspect right. uh, of humanity uh, with regards to a possible link between, you know, alien-human hybridization based on facts that I had discovered, you know, over the last decade, essentially, pointing to the fact that, hey, uh, it's highly likely, you know, with, uh, that, you know, 250,000 years ago, there was a major transformation uh, with respect to uh, the human species uh, involvement. And he was validating uh, this? He, through his, through his data, yes, he's validating that through his data. So through his data, he was validating the fact that we are hybrids, correct? That we are hybrids, that's right. It's a complex structure, but at my website, I actually have um, I actually have a diagram showing exactly what he described to me. Okay, and fair enough. And his role at Dulce was what? How did he become affiliated with the base? So he became affiliated with the base in 1979 when there was um, a set of protocols that were triggered, uh, triggered that enacted a uh, demilitarized zone, the DMZ. There was an engagement that had taken place there not unlike the engagement that took place in, in 1940 uh, uh, with the Murak expedition when they first encountered the Greys, uh, something similar had occurred. Uh, and, and again, uh, his detachment that he worked for, this was a classified detachment uh, out of um, North Highlands, California, which is uh, where McClellan Air Force Base is, uh, is situated. It's now a decommissioned base, but... At the time, it was a very active base, and it had a lot to do uh, with uh, with this. Uh, with, well, anyhow, his was well, Edwards Air Force Base, okay. which was which is what used to be Murak Army Airfield. I just got a little tongue tied there. That's okay. But the story that you're trying to talk to this audience about, if I know, is this legend that's been around for years. Uh, I hope I'm talking uh, talking about is that there was some sort of altercation between the U.S. military within this installation and a group of extraterrestrials that were working at the installation. That's right. Uh, the Greys there, the Aloha Greys. So, so take it from there. Okay. So his he was part of this classified medical detachment. They were flown over to Dulce. I mean, go, I go into a lot of detail, uh, you know, based on the interview. Uh, he goes into a lot of interviews stating that he had never heard of it. The people that were part of this detachment, they had never heard of Dulce. Um, this was something that was brand new to them. They were briefed on the way there, and um, when they arrived, you know, it it just completely blew everybody away. Now, uh, before I before you get to that, arriving at Dulce is very interesting because you have been able to solve a quick question, which is no one has been able to find entry points, which has always hurt the myth and the legend. Tell us why. Because um, they had gone to great lengths to conceal. Uh, to conceal the cavern, first of all, they concealed the cavern. Uh, second of all, uh, there is, you know, there's uh, there's data that proves that there was this uh, this uh, lumber company that was just fabricated for the purposes of actually constructing the early, uh, you know, the, the facility early on back in the 1940s. Um, but it seems as though there was an altitude that this base, the actual entry point, that you you couldn't drive to, correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, well, I mean, you technically you could, uh, you'd have to have an off-road, you know, very very specialized off-road vehicle. But you got to remember, this base is is, is uh, you know, situated within the within the mesa, the Archuleta Mesa. And if you've ever seen the mesa, you know, from the eastern slope all the way over, uh, you know, spanning the, uh, the 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 frontal uh, part, which you know faces uh, the the Dulce Township, we're talking about. You know, hundreds of feet high, columnar, you know, uh, basalt, you know, very, very, very fragmentary uh, rock, very dangerous, lots of shale. It's a very, very heavily forested area. Right. Um, it's so not the, something that you would expect, you know, to be a typical military facility. Fair enough. So the colonel, he describes being choppered into this, correct? That's right. Okay, which which would explain why guys like Bill Burns and, and other small teams doing sort of, you know, amateur research – or just scouring about are not going to stumble upon a trap door leading to the underground Dulce facility, which seems pretty silly in itself, doesn't it? I went to my manager, and then I went to his manager, and from the both of them I found out 
he just left unexpectedly, didn't give any notice or anything. About a year after that, <clears throat> I get a phone call, and I recognize him. And uh, I recognize his voice because uh, he had an English accent. And, and, I, and I immediately started to ask him, oh, what happened? Why did you leave the company? And, you know, this and that. And uh, he dropped his English accent right in the middle of our conversation, which shocked me. Yeah. And um, then he goes on to tell me that uh, he was actually uh, on the run. Um, he had abandoned a, this, uh, this uh, defense uh, contract that he had been a part of. Uh, and he gave me... Quite a few details. Uh, matter of fact, he told me everything. Okay, say, hold, uh, let me let me pause so there. Weird. Let me yeah. pause there, Anthony. Because... Some very interesting information, and I knew that there was something unique about this guy. The following week, um, I'm at work, and I learned that he's gone. He just disappeared, and uh, he wasn't at the shift, at the scheduled shift that he was supposed to be, you know, testing these components. 